Hi, I'm Stephanie McHenry from Instagram's Bake Your Feelings, where we take life experiences and translate them into pie. Flavors, textures, colors, and shapes that remind you of those experiences. It's a hoot. I absolutely love doing it, and I'm honored to be able to share some pie secrets with you today, specifically the most daunting part of the pie, which is a flaky, buttery, homemade crust. And I'll tell you right now, if it's still too daunting by the time we're done here today, A, I didn't do my job, and B, it's okay because I'm a pie ambassador, not a pie snob. Whatever gets it delicious and in your belly is great. But we are going to demystify pie crust for you today so that you can play with your food and with curiosity and joy and zest and sass, get back in that kitchen and play and make that crust. So first things first, we're gonna get all our tools out so we're fully equipped for whatever might happen to be able to make the crust that we want to make as we desire it. So we're starting with measuring. Now notice I've got standard measuring cups and measuring spoons next to a scale. Lecture type. The reason why is because you could take this measuring cup and scoop it into your bin of flour and then toss it back in and scoop it again. And they can weigh differently, even though they're the same volume to fill that cup. That means that one scoop had more density than another. You got more grains of flour in your cup. So if you want exactness, if you want to avoid surprises in your pie baking, weighing will help you with that. So weigh those ingredients and you won't have as many surprises anymore. You'll know exactly how much flour is going into that pie to create the pie you like the way you like it. Next, let's talk about mixing. You can mix your flour and your salt together with a whisk. You can do it with a sifter. However you like is okay, but I often find that I don't see a material difference between whisking it and sifting it in this case. If I was doing a cake, I would feel differently, but with pie, it's so rustic and primitive and we actually want to avoid having things glutenized and stick together too much. This is enough and it'll be delicious. Rolling pins. A lot of controversy around rolling pins, if you believe it or not. This is a French styled tapered edge rolling pin. It is one of my favorites, but the secret about tools, this is where I look like Bam Bam from the Flintstones. I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to share secrets. It doesn't matter. Use what you like. It's about getting to an outcome, not using the approved tools. The outcome I get with this is I can get more ergonomic comfort on the edges with these tapers, and I can feel the weight distributing into the dough so I can predict I've got more of an even roll when I'm rolling out the dough. But if you decide that that's not for you, you love the kind that grandma used to teach you on, or a wine bottle lying around because you can't get to a rolling pin somehow, or a PVC pipe that you've cleaned off really carefully and did not use in any actual plumbing in the making of this pie. All of that is okay. Tools are about getting outcomes. If you can get a good outcome with this guy, do it. This is about celebrating the pie and your courage in the kitchen, not about right and wrong. Not in this pie. Next, one of my favorite tools ever, the bench scraper. Two reasons why I love it. One, I often use it for cutting chilled butter. It gives me some leverage that's a little bit easier than a butcher knife. I also like using it to clean my counters between rolls. This was a big exciting thing for me because when you make enough pies, I made one to seven pies a week every week for the last 15 years. And efficiency became really important to me. I learned that if I grabbed a wet sponge and used that to clean up the flour, it'd be a big gloppy goopy mess and it would be harder to get done. Scrape it up while it's still dry. Get most of the debris and then spray it down. You're good to go. And now for cutting. Let's talk about fats and all the tasty things that go into our pie to make it absolutely blissfully wonderful and Julia Child approved all the butter. This is a pastry cutter. 
I've had many over the years, some more industrial metal looking ones, some wooden handle ones that look so quaint, like something that came out of a sepia printed photo in an album. I love them all. I like this one the most because I make so many, it feels comfortable in my hand. And I use this to cut the bits of butter and fat in my dough as I'm mixing it and get it to the exact size that I want. Why is that important? Because the size of the butter will dictate the size of your flakes in that gloriously flaky crust. That's when we get to decide if we want a sandy flake, like great for decor because it doesn't shift and mutate on you when it's baking, or a medium sized flake or a big fat chunky flake in your rough puff. You cut it to the right size, then if you want it smaller, you use this to get to the size you actually want. Also for cutting, pastry colors or pastry wheels. I've heard this used in, by a bunch of different names. You can adjust the width of the strips that you're cutting with this guy. And that makes it so that when you do a lattice later, you have these beautiful uniform strips of pie crust to be able to ornately lay on your pie top. Other pastry cutter options, I've got a fluted cutter right here. It gives you a little wiggle edge, which can be really cute. I love this guy because I get both on one tool and I can go back and forth and do more textures when I'm playing. Pastry brush, nice and dry, so helpful, vital, because as you're rolling, sometimes you have excess flour and it could mess with the thickness or hydration levels that you worked so carefully to achieve in your dough. A dry brush to brush off the excess flour. Fixed. Pie pans. Maybe I get a little snobby here, and here's why. I love ceramic. They're beautiful, but you get a more even bake than with a lot of other pie pans. And with this guy being the prime example, because it's thin and metal, it means that you're gonna get an uneven bake. These can be great for handing out leftovers or doing a no-bake pie or a press-in crumble crust that doesn't need a lip on it. But for an even bake, this guy isn't gonna cut it. Metal pie pans are great. They have a decent heat distribution and it makes it really easy to have the pie not stick to the pan. But this is a thicker one. If it was thin, I'd be sad again. Glass is amazing because for beginners, it makes it so that you can look underneath and see if the pie is done. If I'm doing a new recipe and I'm tweaking the bake time, or if I've got a recipe and I'm in a new location, like I traveled to visit family and I'm using that Airbnb kitchen or using a relative's kitchen and I'm not familiar with the bake time at that elevation level, this gives me line of sight into how my pie is doing so that I can avoid surprises and watch it as it goes. Big ceramic, little ceramic. Never throw away your scraps. I put it all in here and if I have any leftovers, I grab my kid or the smallest person I can find and I have them take all the scraps of dough and innards and make a little pie in here. Get all the same benefits of ceramic. Mixing bowls. You want it nice and big so that when you're mixing your dough, you can flip it around and the flour won't escape. And these guys are great if you're doing fillings that require any time in the microwave. Can't do that with this guy. Pie weights are so helpful. And I have this secret indulgence. I just love putting my hand and feeling them around like my kid would do that with the flour. Might have been a little dirty, but it felt fun. And these are more than just fun. They help us when we're par baking or blind baking our crust. It weighs it down because you worked so hard with those fat deposits to make all these flakes, that's where the air gets trapped. But if you don't weigh it down, that air is gonna get trapped and make a bubble bottom in your pie, decreasing the amount of space you have available for pie filling. So pie weights weigh down your crust when you're par baking or blind baking. Mother of pearl, that was loud. Now, if you don't have pie weights, that's okay too. You can use dried beans or dried rice. Those are great because they really fill in the nooks and crannies and spread out, but I wouldn't cook with them <laughs> after you do that. So, options. I've got egg wash, 
and another paintbrush for that. Sometimes I use this dry as a pastry brush. Sometimes I use it wet for glazing on my pies. Great to have around. A fork for docking. What do you mean, Steph? What's docking? Docking is when you puncture holes in the bottom of your pie, giving an escape route for the air when you're baking. When you get that flaky crust, the air has to go somewhere. So it bubbles up, but it also needs to come out. These are the escape holes for that air, so you don't have a bubble bottom. Other options that are really fun when you get to the decorating stage, you can strip these out and do your lattice work, but you can also get stamps and create all sorts of fun shapes and line those on the edges or on top. You can get fondant sculpting tools and become like the really fancy people on the interwebs who sculpt their pie dough. But there's lots of options for you. And if you head to my Instagram, there's dozens of examples of ways to crimp, ways to decorate the top, or some of these tools and tricks that you can always go back to and ask questions about. I love helping. Sharing my pie bliss with the world, it's, it keeps me up at night. So help me sleep by asking for help. And that's about it. It really is accessible. You can do this without any of the fancy stuff. And now, the fun part. We're gonna mix up our first dough. I'm gonna carry these out of the way and get ready for that. And now the fun begins. We get to mix our dough. This is often a part that people get scared at, but today, again, we're demystifying that and make it really straightforward. We have flour. I've already measured and, and mixed together with the salt. We have our butter, and I'm cutting it up to the specified amount. And I'm not using a food processor for this because I want you to do a couple things. One, I want you to see that you don't need a food processor to make pie. It is totally accessible to you today. And two, I wanna show you a medium-sized flaky dough meaning when you bake it, you're gonna have that sweet spot, that Goldilocks happy place of just the right size of flakes for that pie. These are nice and cold from the, uh, from the fridge, and I'm using my bench scraper to cut into it. It gives me more leverage than a butcher knife. Not required if you don't have a bench scraper, but helpful. All right. I now have strips of butter that are about a half inch in size on the side, width and height, and I'm slicing them up in half inch chunks as I go along through the butter. And if you have a little variance, that's okay. You can have some medium sized flakes with some smaller size and some slightly larger size, especially if it's a rustic pie. It makes it feel even more organic looking. All right, I've got these guys cut up. I need just a little bit more butter to get the right amount. I've got this guy waiting in the fridge for me. And we'll do exactly the same thing. On the side once, rotate. On that side once, half inch cubes all around. They look like cheese balls, but more diabolical. I love it. Now, as I go through, I have really hot hands. I can tell because as I'm holding them, they're starting to get a little glisteny from the butter. I don't know if you can see that reflecting, but if your fingers start to glisten or the butter starts to glisten, get it back in the fridge. We want it as chilled as possible. Ultimately, to make a delightfully flaky crust, we have to follow the golden rule of pie crust. It is make it cold and bake it hot. To get those flakes, it's all about keeping the butter chilled and intact all throughout the process. And then bam, hit it with the heat in the oven and blast it until it just evaporates. And the footprint that's left, the hose, are the flakes. How big you want them is dependent on how big your chunks of fat are when they evaporate. The space that's left is your flake size. So if you like them not too flaky, more like a sandy flake, Get these guys tiny like sand. If you want a big, rough puff, gloriously rustic crust, make them nice and big and chunky bits of butter. If you want something in between, do exactly what we're doing today. Now, do it quickly because it could melt. <laughs> and as I go through another little trick that you wouldn't necessarily see in a cookbook, but it's really helpful, 
a schmush. I don't know how to spell it, but I do it all the time. Schmush. I take the palm of my hand and I flatten it, scrape it up with my scraper and pop it in. Why? Because it makes it easier to roll out later because you have flat pieces instead of these big gnarly cubes. It makes it more easy dough to roll. So I'm gonna move these guys out of my way and I'm gonna show you guys exactly what this looks like. Here's my butter, palm of the hand, schmush. You can even say it out loud because I love cooking with sound effects. And then scrape it up, pop it in, and then I make sure that the bits of butter get a nice light coating of flour all over so that when it hits other bits of butter, it doesn't stick to it and mess up the size of the flakes that I'm going for in this recipe. And I do that till it's done. Schmush, coat, move on. Schmush, coat, move on. Over and over again. Now I'm not using a pastry cutter here, you'll notice. And that's because I'm already happy with the size of the fat deposits. These are exactly the size flakes that I want. So if you weren't happy with the size and you wanted smaller flakes, more of a sandy, mealy textured flake, you grab your pastry cutter and start digging into it. But I'm gonna show you what it's like when you don't have to. So you can get freaking flaky pies going for your holidays. Hashtag freaking flaky. I'm sure it'll sweep the nation. <laughs> All this butter, I feel like Julia Childs. It's kind of a dream. Bon appétit. Idol. Icon. God bless her. This is a good way to die. No one's making it out alive. I'm leaving on a slide made out of butter. Landing in a pie. That sounds like my idea of nirvana. It's an addiction. Every time I have a good meal, I think, ooh, this is good. You know what would make it better? <sighs> Putting it in a pie. All right, turn in the corner, finishing this up. Check this out. All those butter bits we smushed and stuck in there, they're all lightly coated in flour, which means they're not stuck to each other, and I get to have the exact size flake that I designed at the outset. Now we get to mix it with water. And I always do this with my hands. Even if I'm using a food processor to mix in the butter with the flour, I still take it out and do the hydration part with the water in a bowl. Why? Partly because I like getting my hands dirty, because it's fun and it makes me feel like I'm five. And two, more importantly, it makes it so that I can feel the hydration and where there's clumpy bits that have more water, I can break them up and spread them out for an even distribution of liquid. I have my water here, it's super chilled. I had ice melt in it and it has just finished melting so it's nice and cold and it's not gonna melt the butter when we stick it in here. Now, in your recipe, you'll see how much water is called for and you use that as a baseline. But the reality is, and these are more secrets that you wouldn't get in a recipe, hydrating the dough is something you kind of have to do by feel. You can use the measurements as a guidepost, but if you live in a more humid area, you're gonna need less water. If you lead in, live in a drier area, you, you're gonna need more. If you're at a lower elevation, you're gonna need less water. If you're at a higher elevation, you're going to need increasingly more water depending on how high you are in the world. So we give you a baseline 
but there's still a little bit of room to dial it in and get it just right for who you are and where you're baking from. So I'm starting with a third of a cup. That's my baseline for this single layer of double crust. And I want you to see here that I'm just tossing with it. I'm not kneading it. I'm not trying to mash the butter into the flour. I'm just tossing it because I want to get the water into the flour without messing with the butter. And I know that it's right when I can barely bring it together. It's a little chunky and there isn't any flour dust falling off of it telling me it's too dry and needs more water, but it's also not too shiny telling me that there's too much water in it reflecting the light making it shiny. Get both my hands in here. Feeling like Julie Andrews. Singing to my dough. Packing it with joy. <laughs> Embarrassing my kid. I made peace with that a long time ago. There we go. Now, if you find yourself feeling like the dough, whoops, leans a little too far to dry or too far to wet, pause before you go any further. If it's too dry, add a tablespoon of water at a time until it's right. If it's a little too wet, better that it be a little too wet later than too dry. We can always adjust that by adding more flour. Lots of forgiveness available to you in making pie crust. And these aren't complicated ingredients. We're not doing anything funky like a souffle or stove work. This is just mixing and being patient to toss it and not grip it. And she's done. Check this out. I'm going to plop her on the counter with my gnarly goopy hands and all. I love this part. It's so fun. And then, oh, lost some butter. I want all of it. There's your pie crust. Let the joy commence. It's wonderful. I'm going to now mash this into, well, gently mash, into a disc. I want it to be flat and round and about an inch thick or so. I'm gonna wrap it airtight in plastic wrap. Why airtight, Stephanie? I'm glad you asked. Because when it goes in the fridge, we just work so hard to get the hydration right. We don't want any air seeping into it and messing with it and drying it out. So airtight in the fridge for about 30 minutes to an hour or until the chilliness of it has bound it together rather than kneading it to bind it together. Then we'll roll it out. All right, let's grab our plastic wrap. Wrap this guy airtight in our disc. Yassi, okay. Pick it up, plop it down. It's not totally together. If you look really closely, you can see cracks and stuff in the middle. It's just gathered enough, really focusing on not kneading the dough to keep that butter intact and get those nice flakes later. Rolling, wrapping, rolling, wrapping. Getting this extra air tight on the last one. Give it a little squeeze, a little cup to bind it together just a little bit and then whoosh, flatten it. There's our disc, it's about one and a half inches. That's fine. Pop it in the fridge. I was gonna say oven, that would be really fun to see. In the fridge for 30 to 60 minutes. Ta-da, I have another one chilled, ready to go so you can see it. And this is fun because we get to talk about lamination. What a nation, lamination. It's folding the dough so that you can get layers and layers of those flakes. So say it's not flaky enough and you want it freaking, freaking flaking, double freaking. Then you get to do this folding technique called lamination and you get rows on top of rows of flakes. Heaven, really, just what could be better? I'm going to lightly flour this surface. More technique and tips, hold it really high, you feel like a superstar and you get a more even distribution of flour on your counter. Mm 
Mm, edible fairy dust. Ba -da 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 -da. A little more. <laughs> little shimmy. Help. There. All right. Rolling this guy out. Lamination. I want oodles and oodles of flakes in this one. Here's how I do it. Ooh, check this out. This guy's sticking a little bit. It's a great lesson learned and technique. It was leaning a little bit more towards too much water. Remember I mentioned it's easier to fix it if there's just a touch too much water than if there's not enough. This is okay. I'm just gonna add more flour. It pops off. Do a little bit of that, a little bit of that. That gets some flour in there so it's not so sticky anymore and it'll roll nicely. And I'm gonna keep a pile of flour right there so that it's easy for me to just dab and wipe without losing my lightly floured surface. Might seem like a small tip, but when you make a ton of pies, one to seven a week, every week for 15 years, oddly specific, I wonder who did that. Eh. Then you find those efficiency tricks and they're joyful points of relief. I love them. Little hacks. Now, I'm gonna want a little more in my pile. I always put the lid back on to avoid stuff falling in the flour. My rolling pin. Hand in the pile, rub on the rolling pin anytime you need it. If it's sticking, do that back and forth again. Now I'm rolling this out and for lamination, again, my goal in this demo is to show you a scenario where you want tons more flakes, tons. We're folding this guy and we can do that once, we can chill it and then do it again twice. It's up to you, whatever your preference. How do you like your pie? And because I'm laminating and not getting it ready to assemble in a pie dish, I'm not focused on rolling a round circle. I'm focused on creating a square or a rectangle. Easier for folds. Every time you see the dough pull up on your pin, that's because it's not covered in flour and up, it's sticking. So reflour your pin. Every time you see that, you'll avoid it sticking to your pin and messing up your flow. Throwing off the emperor's groove. Come here, you. Now this was a rough puff, different than what we just did. The last one we did had half inch cubes of butter. This has three quarters to one inch cubes of butter. And this is what it's like when it's spread out. These are big fat gnarly suckers in this thing. And you're gonna get these massive, massive flakes when you roll this out and bake it. So if it looks a little different, that's why, but it's nice to see the difference as well when you're going from different size flakes in this process so that you can be informed when you think about how you want to design your own pie. All right, just a little more flour. I feel like it needs to be a little thinner. There you go. Come on, you. When it's chill, that's harder to work through, but that's what you want. Put your back into it. There we go. Now this is interesting. This was harder to make into a rectangle and ended up looking more like an amoeba. And that's okay. I'm gonna fold it up and no one's gonna know the difference. No judgment here. Go play with your food and come back when you shed all of those shame triggers. I'll be the one making all the jokes for 12 year olds. So I've got my pastry brush, all this excess flour, I'm gonna brush off with my dry brush because I'm managing the hydration levels. If I leave that in there, it'll start to dehydrate your dough. It'll be drier. This is just right. I don't wanna mess that up. So I'm getting rid of any excess. I have folded it into thirds. I'll show you again. Remember, this guy came over and this guy over that. Because if I folded it in half and half again, this gives me 50% more layers of flakes for each round of lamination without overcomplicating it. I'll do the same thing again in thirds. Bring a corner to the middle, brush it off. Bring the other corner to the middle and brush it off. 
Now this butter is starting to heat up just in that short period of time. You can see these bits sticking to the counter. Grab some more flour, tap it on there, get rid of all the dry, the wet bits, get it nice and dry, brush off an excess, and then wrap it airtight and stick it back in the fridge to chill. And when it is chilled, it'll be easier to roll out. The layers won't be shifting around on you. They will have bound together in the cold and you'll be able to roll it out into a round piece of dough for your pie. And I have a special treat for you. I made a mealy dough and a rough puff dough. We made earlier a medium flake. This is teeny tiny flakes and big fat flakes and I laminated it so that you can see what it's like when it's cooked. Check this out. Da, 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 da. These are doughs that were just like this, folded up and laminated and I sliced them in half so that you could see the inside and I baked them. Can you guess which one had teeny tiny sand-like bits of butter and which one had big fat chunks of butter like a rough puff? See all those tiny holes? You can see the layers from the folding, but each flake, each hole is teeny tiny. That was the mealy dough where the bits of butter were like sand. See all these massive defined holes and in between all those layers, it almost looks like a croissant. That's because the bits of fat were huge. And then we laminated it. So you get more flake and more definition. They're all good. They're all tasty. You get to decide who you are in a pie. Pick your favorite and use all the techniques to have as few surprises as possible. You are in control. You get to design your life in pie. And that was lamination. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our dough, we're gonna roll it out in a circle, put it in a pie dish, and I'm gonna show you how to crimp it. And it's not just your grandmother's fingerprint. If you want something kooky, then you can do that too. Lots of options. While I'm grabbing this from the fridge, fun tidbit for storing your pies. You can store pre-made dough in the fridge for up to 24 hours, and you can freeze it for three to six months. It's a game changer in terms of efficiency. If you have a ton of pies to make on Thanksgiving day, or if you're like me and it's a Tuesday and that's reason enough to make a bunch of pies, then it's really helpful to have a bunch of dough discs waiting for you in the freezer or in the fridge the day before so that you're not killing yourself to get it all done in one day. Next, we're rolling this guy out and getting it ready to go in the pie dish. I am going to give myself a fresh surface. In comes the bench scraper to save my butt again, making my life so much easier than a wet sponge and a gloppy mess. And fresh flour. Up high like a superstar, nice and even. Okay. This guy goes in the flour. Flip it over, do it again, all over, because it was just a little shiny. I'm fixing it now that I'm rolling it out. Keep that pile there. All right, let's roll this guy. Rolling. If you're doing a circle, you want to go from the center out, and you want to pivot it every now and then to make sure it's not sticking to the surface. You want to catch that before it gets too late. I need a little more flour on this guy. I've got my little pile of flour over here and I'm getting that on my rolling pin. Way faster than going back and forth with the flour, the tub over there. And it makes me feel like a wizard when I do that and go back over. Like poof, disappear in smoke. I love that. So center out, center out, but it's pretty intuitive at this point. If you notice it not going in the direction you want it to go, you just change direction. I'm noticing this is getting a little dry. You 
you want at least an inch of crust hanging over the edge of your pie dish. Why? So that you can tuck it under when we get to that point. So this is the stage when we need to be mindful of that, getting the right diameter for your pie dish. Also check your pie dish to see if it's a standard depth or if it's deeper than normal because that will affect how big you need to roll your dough. The deeper the pie dish, the bigger you need to roll it. For this demo, standard size pie, just a couple inches. But I do love a deep one. Make it a mile high stuffed with apples and other glorious bits. Fruit of the gods. All right, I am almost there. You can measure it. There's tools out there to be able to you know, roll it on a mat and see how long your diameter is if you'd like. I've been doing this, so many of these for years, I generally know how big it is. And if I'm wrong, eh, I know how to fix that too and I'll show you how. There you go. Come to Mama Steph. It is so hard to do this without music. You folks at home, I hope you're listening to music while you're enjoying this. I know you have to hear my voice, but it's just not the same unless I got Otis Redding playing on vinyl so I can dance as I do it. I think it makes it taste better because you taste the joy of the dance. <laughs> all the feelings to bake and stick them in a pie all right i'm going to grab that pie dish and show you how to get it in there and as you do so do it in a way that avoids shrinkage of the crust as you're baking how many of you have seen that before watch this i've chosen a glass dish with a lip on it you want at least a half inch to an inch so that when you crimp it they have a place to rest, all that crimped edge. If you have one of those ones that have a handle on the side but no lip in between, it's still okay. It's good for like press-in crusts, like cookie crusts or crumb crusts. But if you want something with a classic pastry dough that has a crimp on the edge, you need a pie dish with a lip. Important to keep in mind when you're shopping for dishes. Now I'm gonna flour this guy up. And I'm going to roll my dough onto the rolling pin. And I'm also going to get my dry pastry brush and I'm going to brush off any excess flour as I go so I don't mess up with the, the hydration levels that we worked so hard to get earlier. If you have sections that are sticking opposite end of the problem, right here it's starting to stick, meaning the butter needs to chill a little bit, get your bench scraper and just short movements, scooping it as you go to keep it from sticking and ripping your dough. And when you see that, the second it goes in the pie dish, get it back in the fridge, cool it back down. Well, Stephanie, how often should I chill my pie? I'm so glad you asked. This is just one of them. In the beginning, when you make that dough disc, that's the first time. In between each round of lamination, that's the second time. Right after this, when you put it in the pie dish and before you even stick anything in it, I chill it. And that's what prevents shrinkage. I get it in here not by pulling, but by, by dropping it into the crevices so I'm not stretching it. If you stretch it to push it in, then you're already pulling apart those glutinous molecules that want to snap back together when it's baking. So we drop it in and rest it, drop it in and rest it, not stretching. And then we chill it in the fridge, not only to keep the butter chilled so we get those flakes protected, but also so that if it's going to shrink, I know how much is going to shrink before I cut the excess. You could cut the excess here and then it shrinks and then you don't have any dough on that lip that we worked so hard to get when picking out our pans. So it's simple to make a pie it's just thoughtfulness, just a little patience for it. We all deserve that. So right here with nothing cut off on the edge, draped like a tablecloth, I'm gonna put this in the fridge, no more than 10 minutes when it's uncovered like this or the hydration will start to evaporate. 
but 10 minutes is enough to chill that dough and see what kind of shrinkage we're gonna get and then cut the edge off. This bad boy's been chilling in the fridge. I saw a little bit of shrinkage. This is a little shorter than it was before, but now I know exactly with confidence where to trim it without worrying about it shrinking even more when it bakes in the oven. I'm gonna grab my scissors and I'm gonna leave about a half inch around the whole perimeter. I'm gonna show you several different crimps. One of my favorites, I'm eliminating the option to do right now by trimming off the edge, but you can just take this and fold it right over the filling and it looks sort of like a pocket wrapped up in a throw blanket. It's really cozy and rustic and cute. But I'm trimming it off for this example. Rotating to get all those sides. And if it's a little uneven, that's okay. When you fold it under, no one's gonna see how long it was. We just want them roughly the same so that when you fold it under, they're all close in thickness. If you're folding more pie crust under, it will be thicker. All these tendrils. Do not throw these scraps away. Get them on a cookie sheet, cover them in melted butter, or use your egg wash, cover them in cinnamon and sugar, or cardamom, or do a spicy savory one, cover it in cheese and nuts and herbs and spices. That stuff's great. All right, I've trimmed. I'm tucking the dough underneath to get a nice even edge. Anything that was irregular before is hidden by that little tuck underneath, tuck underneath. And if at any point I'm doing this and it starts to feel like maybe the butter's getting a little warm, that means it is. We don't leave it to uh, wondering. We just pop it back in the fridge and make sure that we protect ourselves from melting butter. Tucking all the way around, almost done. It'll also be easier to crimp if it is chilled. It'll hold the form better if it's slow moving and bound in a chilled state. So I have folded this under, trimmed and folded. Now I can start doing crimps. First things first, we can do a a classic thumbprint finger pinch where you take your pointer finger and your thumb and point them down, stick them on the side of the perimeter, and then take your other finger and press in between and just squeeze in opposite directions. That's your classic finger, finger pinch version. But there's so many versions of this. I'm gonna get a fork. You can do the forked edge that everyone else did, but you can also breed them together and create a hybrid of the finger pinch and the fork by replacing your opposite finger with the fork and press, 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 press. And you get the fun texture of the fork with the wave of the finger pinch. It's really fun. You can do back and forth side to side with these. These are just some of the most simple ones. If you go to my Instagram, I'm doing roses, I'm doing leaves, I'm braiding, I'm doing all sorts of fun things. One of my favorites I call the regal crimp. And I happen to have some extra scraps over here, so we'll use that. I'm gonna roll them into little balls. This is fun. Ball number one, ball number two, ball number three. I do the same classic finger pinch crimp. One, two, three. And then I drop these in the spot where the finger holes go. One, two, three. That's kind of a circusy clown collar look to me. It's fun and playful. And when I was raising a smaller human, now they're an old teenager, but when they were tiny, they were like, oh, it's like mermaid pearls from under the sea, you know, you can do so much meaning and connection and storytelling through food. And I do it with pie, flavors, textures, colors, shapes. This is just the beginning. 
if I wanted to do a rose, I know I mentioned it, I don't mean to tease you and not do it. I'm going to make three little circles. I've just got a bottle cap right here. This is maybe an inch in diameter. That's pretty tiny. I would usually use a bigger one, but this is just for learning so you get an idea for it, how much flexibility there is. I'm scooting this off to the side so you can see. I'm just scooping out three little circles. I've got another good scrap over here. And get a better circle. Cool. So to make a rose, I lay one, I overlap the next one, and I overlap the last, oh, overlap the last one. I just kind of press on the connecting parts and then I roll them all together. So dang cute. Use my fork to create two different roses by pressing down in between. And now you've got little rose buds that you can line your edge with. So simple. And if they're bigger, then you can kind of fan them out and make big knockout type roses. It's really pretty. So we've got our traditional finger pinch. We've got our fork. We've got our hybrid of the finger, print, the finger pinch and the fork. We've got our little chevron fork pattern. We've got our regal one that's so playful and bobbly. We've got our roses. We have some extra scraps we could turn into a ribbon edge. A what? A ribbon edge, and it's so pretty. Check this out. I'm grabbing my scraps. Thankfully, I've got lots of long tendrils to work with. And I'm just going to get my pastry cutting tool and create nice straight lines out of what I have. And then cutting it off. Now I've got a nice long strip. And I'm going to lay it down and create a little lip and then do it again and then do it again and there's my little ribbon edge with all these little bow loop-de-loos as you go around it's a pretty whimsical little edge and you can do that over and over again you can connect them really easily to keep that going all the way around the perimeter of your pie Just drop it and loop it. Drop and loop, drop and loop. How cute is that? Kind of more unusual, which is fun, and not much more effort And using the scraps that you have that you worked so hard to create. One more left. What should we do? Oh, I've got it. This will be fun. I'm gonna bring this over. I'm gonna get some scissors and I'm going to cut little notches all the way around just like so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm going to tuck some of them folding into the pie and some of them folding out of the pie. In, out, in, out, in, out, in sort of a checker pattern, almost like a chessboard. Also very playful. These are just one, two, three, four, five, six options out of dozens and dozens. If you go to my Instagram, I'm constantly coming up with new ways to finish off your pie and make it look like you feel in pie. Let's paint it with egg wash. This is one whole egg with a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of water. The water makes it so it's less gloppy and you get a more even glaze on your dough. I used a fork to whip it up. Now I've got my paintbrush. I'm just lightly going around the edge. I just want to glisten, give it that professional look. Getting in all those crevices. And then like I said before, I'm going to get this right back in the fridge. That's the fourth time I absolutely chill it. When you make your dough disc in between lamination, 
when you roll it out and stick it in the pie dish and then right after you assemble it. Get it back in that fridge one more time. Keeping that fat nice and chilled so it's completely untampered with until we smack it with some heat in the oven and blast it into oblivion. Boy, that makes me sound rather evil. Don't worry, I use my pie powers for good, not evil. <laughs> Come here, you little rosebuds. Come here, you little ribbons. So pretty. One day, I'm gonna come up with an egg wash that you can spray on it like aerosol spray, like hairspray, and then we don't have to paint anymore. But as it is, I'm grateful for that old world feel that I get when I pull out my paintbrush and finish it off. Now, if I were to par bake, meaning partially bake this, or blind bake, meaning completely bake this, versus putting a bunch of filling in it raw and do 100% of the cooking in the oven after that, then I would take my fork and I would dock, AKA puncture the bottom, leaving escape routes for all the air that comes out of the pie crust when you zap that butter so that you don't end up with a bubble bottom. Lots of times bubble bottoms are great. This is not one of them. And make sure you do those sides too, because that crust everywhere wants to bubble and it'll get it on the sides if you're not careful and puncture it. All right. If you are doing an egg wash inside, make sure that you puncture afterwards because if you do the egg wash after you puncture the holes, it can go and fill in those holes and defeat the whole purpose of having them there. Finally, if you are going to par or blind bake, you can add in some parchment paper and fill it with pie weights. I'm gonna get some parchment paper. That's plastic wrap. My parchment paper is over here. Got my parchment paper. Here's another cool trick. Some people just press it in and then it ends up popping out all over the place and gets not into the crevices the way you want to when you put your pie weights in there. Now it will be a custom fit to your pie dish and you won't miss out on getting all those pie weights into every crevice. Let's see, all oh, this guy fell off. Come here, you. You can also twist those ribbons. There's just so many options. That's going in. Now the pie weights that I love so much. My mermaid pearls, as my kid says. Yes, you want that much. Why? Remember how I talked about the sides could bubble on you too, not just the bottom? This makes it so that the weight goes all the way to the brim and keeps the sides at bay as well as the bottom. So no unwanted bubbles, just where we want them in those flakes in the crust itself. Pop this in the oven for as long as you need to in your recipe, fully for blind bake and partially for par baking. And then when you're done, You just pull it out. There you go. Someday when I die and I leave this house to my kid, she's gonna find pie weights all over the house in random crevices like pine needles from your Christmas tree. You can do this. You can absolutely do this. Pie is one of the most forgiving, primitive things you can do. And I hope you found this empowering. When I first started making pie, I was daunted. Then I stopped putting so much pressure on myself and got playing with it. Play with your food, be curious, and then find me on Instagram if you have any questions. I love questions. Bake your feelings and have a great holiday.